when the friendship or the mentorship between Paul Through and V.S. No. Paul ended, Paul Through knew immediately that he would have to write about it. But he did not anticipate the reaction that the book would receive. Even before it was public, critics on both sides of the Atlantic lashed out at what they thought was an unfair attack. But for Through, this book is not about revenge. It is a chronicle of what he calls the rarest and most fragile of alliances, the literary friendship. I am pleased to have him on this broadcast to talk about this. The book is called Servidia's Shadow, A Friendship Across Five Continents. Uh, it is a fascinating story. Let me begin by saying I have never seen the reaction of the literary community about this. It is saying, why are you, sir, beating up on someone who you had this sort of incredible relationship with, mm -hmm. and he opened so many doors for you, he taught you so much, mm -hmm. he, in a sense, gave you a friendship, and then you... What? Turn around and trashed him in this book. That's right. And, and of all people, I, I, you're saying the literary, yeah. literary people, of all people to say, how could you do this? Exactly. How could you write about a living man? How, exactly. could you, how could you use someone you know? People who use, I mean, the most cannibalistic people in the world uh, are the literary community. Mm -hmm. And the, the press was doing the same thing. How could you report private conversations? How could you be so improper? You know, the impropriety of delving into it. But the press does it all the time. Literary people do it all the time. Novelists do it all the time. And Naipaul, this man I wrote about, of course, has spent his life writing about his friends. I've spent my life writing about people that I know. So that's normal. I mean, that's not even... The idea of, of, of writing about your friends and family, your nearest and dearest, that's what writers do. Tell me about the moment, though, in which... What happened in the end to cause the breakup? In the end... Okay, without skipping 30 years. We'll come back to that because that's what the book is about. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, I can only speculate, but he remarried. You know, sometimes the new wife often is a bridge burner. She's a bridge burner and she has a big broom. So I often f I felt, I don't know this for sure, but I think probably when he remarried uh, that his second wife looked at me, saw that I had been friendly with the first wife and may have, may have uh, seen me as something of less than an ally, so burnt my bridge. In the end, I didn't know whether that was true, and so God arranged for me to meet him, bump into him in London at the end of 90, uh, the spring of 97. I was walking down Gloucester Road, he was walking up Gloucester Road, and I bumped into him. In 32 years, I knew him for 33, I had never bumped into him. You know, City, uh, uh, London is a city of Everything seven. was planned and everything was about... Beca arranged, by, arranged by some uh, almighty. Uh, uh, by, um, uh, by the almighty, probably, so that I could write the book. Anyway, I bumped into him and I said, so what's the story? And he said, uh, nothing. He said, uh, but I said, did you know about this fax that your wife sent me? And he said, yes, yes. I said, so what should we do about it? He said, take it on the chin and move on. And then something ended, then some snap, then music starts playing, he walked off, scuttled off into the distance, and I started thinking, it's over, he knows it's over, the friendship is over, therefore I felt oddly lightheaded and lighthearted, and I thought, I'm liberated, the way, because it, I had always felt I wanted to write about him, but you can't write about someone if you have an intense friendship with, and a mentor relationship. The man made me a writer, or helped make me a writer, but I wanted to write about him, and I thought, well, if you're not if the friendship is over, you're then free to write about it. I mean, not that I'm Tina, I'm not Tina Turner writing about Ike Turner. You know, it's not a celebrity tell-all book. Yeah. It's a book about how I became a writer and what kind of people we are, I suppose. This, the, the complex and the strange relationship uh, between writers, which is, in, Boswell wrote about Johnson, but you've, you'll find damn few books by one writer but about that another was an writer. an admiring book. But yeah, 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 an this acolyte. This is not That's right. no, it's, an admiring uh, book. It's both. It's not hagiography because he's not a saint, but then neither am I. So, you know. <laughs> All right, but the, what was the facts deal with the wife? Weird could, fact. Uh, you know, we, we uh, Loopy looked like a, a ransom note, you know, big printed letters and uh, Loopy thing came crinkling through my fax machine. Like, Goodness gracious. Just a lot of strange <laughs> raving. But let me <laughs> go back a little bit. I'm dialing you back a couple of points That's so here. So you actually have found out that she was putting up for auction some of the first edition of your book signed by you. Yeah. 
that were part of his library, and she, she or somebody was putting them up for auction because you read where they were being advertised, correct? That's right, right, yes. And so you write her a letter or call her up and say, or him, and say, what's going here? Why are you doing this? Right, but, but, but I wrote the letter in a spirit of great comedy because if someone, if someone sells your library, these are books written to him. And by the way, this is just a detail in the book, but it's an interesting detail because you're a bibliophile. I am somewhat. If, uh, if, if someone sells books of yours and you sell them for $50, and then the, the, you see them in a catalog for $1,500, you realize that a book dealer is like a glorified junk dealer, and you realize they're just inflating the price of junk. It's like a yard sale or flea market stuff. So I sent him a, a, a note saying, I see you're deaccessioning your library. And so what do you, I said, what do you think of these prices? Because I knew he wouldn't have seen, known the prices. That, that didn't bother me. In fact, I thought it was funny. And in fact, I thought it was, it was sort of poetic justice that he sends, sells books by the pound and then books, book dealers are inflating the price. I don't have a problem with that. People selling books, you know, that's, that's not. But I think with friendship, there's trust in friendship. And there's, uh, friendship is a wonderful, pure, love, it's a lovely thing because it's not, it's not about sex. It's not about power. It's not, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you into bed. I want to marry you or anything like that. It's really about, you, and you never, friends don't talk about it. They say, I love being your friend. Friends don't do that. People who are in love say, I love you, but, but friends are just kind of there for you. That's what friends are for. They, and they, they do things. And they help you, and they see your weaknesses and your inadequacies. And if you're a writer, writers are weird people. They're cranks. They're eccentrics. They're problematical. You see them all the time. You know that. I mean, this table has seen probably the weirdos of the century. Yes. You know, no offense intended. They've also, they're also great writers. I mean, the fact that a person is a wonderful writer doesn't make him Mr. Normal, Mr. Natural, or anything like that. So that, I think that's the subject of my book. Maybe that's the subject of uh, Amadeus. Some have said that you were doing to him what uh, Hemingway did to Fitzgerald in A Movable Feast. But Fitzgerald in A Movable Feast is the most wonderful character. And he's, he's an oddball. He's inadequate. You know, I read that recently. And he's, he's unreliable. He lies. He's a drunk. He's a hypochondriac, ter terrific hypochondriac. You know that Hemingway respects him as a writer, but that if it weren't for Hemingway writing about Fitzgerald, we would have um, a very diluted, uh, very kind of foppish Fitz Fitzgerald. But uh, uh, Hemingway describes his mouth. He says he's a kind of feminine mouth. He describes his short legs, his dandyish clothes, uh, the fact that he doesn't show up when he's supposed to show up to, to go, the fact that he, he's worried about his equipment, you know, his uh, you know, sexual, sexually, uh, where am I? And Hemingway takes him to the Louvre and shows him some statue and says, you know, that's, uh, that's what a willy really looks like. And, yeah. uh, so the, the idea that, I'd, I mean, I'd be flattered, deeply flattered if, if someone said, did someone say that I did? Yeah. Wonderful. There is no higher praise. That you're trying to do to <laughs> Naipaul what Hemingway did. But Hemingway Fitzgerald. wasn't cutting him down to size. Okay. Hemingway was doing, that was, that was a life study. It was a portrait. Then are you trying to cut him down to size in this book? Are, what's your objective in this book? I think if I have an objective, it was that I realized that this book had never been written. That's why any writer writes a book. They say, it's not that you're doing something, a variation on a theme, but you say, no one has ever written this book about these people with this theme. And what, I'm, I, what I tried to, to I, I suppose, demonstrate was that two writers can be friends, the older writer, the younger writer. I'm the sorcerer's apprentice. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. When I was, uh, uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to read a book like this. I wanted to know how does a person become a writer? What are writers really like? What do they worry about? How do you get a book published? What is the attitude toward money? You want to money? get inside the life of a inside, writer. Yeah, inside, but not as a biographer, because a biographer is a kind of wannabe. Yeah. Or a biography is inevitably an autobiography. They're writing about themselves when they're writing about these other things. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, but I, uh, the idea of showing the relationship between writers and that, that friendship is such a wonderful thing. So the, I, when people say it's a betrayal, that hurt me. Uh, uh, if, if someone says it's a betrayal, I don't feel that it is a betrayal. I think that, that in, in, it's a very... But it's a very faithful portrait, and you can't be, you know, it has complete fidelity to what happened. Now listen to this. This is you in this book quoting him, quote, from him. 
You must give me the pleasure of seeing what I look like. It would be like hearing one's voice, seeing oneself walk down the street. You must feel free. I know, for instance, that I was once young and that I have changed, lost and gained and sometimes strayed as I have grown older. Show me. Meaning that he wanted somehow you as a fellow writer, as a protege, him being the mentor, you being the protege, somehow to observe him. And maybe he knew all along that somehow that you were being his Boswell? Possibly his Boswell, possibly his amanuensis, possibly Sorcerer's Apprentice. Also, you see, it, it's an amazing thing when a writer realizes that another writer who's, you know, if I may say so, a reasonably accomplished writer is writing about you. You are, you're looking at a portrait. Imagine having your portrait painted by, well, not Rembrandt, but let's say Lucian Freud, not Francis Bacon. But let's say your, your, your portrait is paint, painted by a competent right. person. That's an amazing moment. You look at the portrait and you say, you know, when Somerset Mom had his portrait painted by Sutherland, he looked at it. He said, actually, I looked like a madam in a Chinese whorehouse. But he was interested when um, uh, uh, Churchill had his portrait. You're interested in a, in, in, in a portrait of... Naipaul was interested in how he looked. What do I look like? What do I sound like? But of course, when you actually see it, you know, when Churchill saw, uh, saw his portrait, he didn't like it. And, and Churchill's wife burnt it, the portrait of, of him by Sutherland. Well, so, but take Gertrude Stein. Picasso's painting of Gertrude Stein, nobody liked it and said, and he said, she said, it's what I'm becoming. Yeah. She understood that it was her. He repainted the face, though. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, in this... Three in months the, later, after coming back in the summer. But, but I think that we know very little about writers. And I'll tell you something. It, when I was growing up, Writers were heroes. They were like pop stars. They were enigmatic, mysterious, strange. They weren't at every Barnes and Noble. They weren't at the Borders reading. They were in Paris. They were in, you know, doing. They were the Hemingway type. James Jones, William Styron. Here's what Naipaul said again: Don't prettify it. And the greatest writing is a disturbing vision offered from a position of strength. Aspire to that and tell the truth. I mean, do you somehow think some way that you are doing what he? in a sense, was teaching you to do not about him, but about writing? That's a very, very good point that you're saying, which is that you raise someone to be a writer. You teach the person uh, the rudiments of writing, and then you say, your basic lesson is, you say, well, how, how do I become a writer? In, in, in three words, how do you become a writer? Tell the truth. It's like Jesus says, you know, that how, how must a man, man says, how should you be, a, uh, how can I be saved? Good master, how should I be saved? And then he says, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, the golden rule. Just, you know, he goes through all the rules. And then the, the basic rule is in writing is tell the truth. And so I always felt to anyone who criticized this book, I would say, it's the truth as I saw it. And it's not the spurned lover. It's not, I'm not trying to get even. As a matter of fact, it's 30 years of pleasure and comedy. You know, he's a funny man, extremely funny. And some of the situations, being in a restaurant... Do you think you have the balance here between what was funny and interesting about him and what was petty and, and bitchy about him? I assume there's a, there's, there's, there's a balance. What's petty? You know, sometimes pettiness is the, is the greatest comedy. And he's kind of the Jack Benny of literature anyway. He's very, very mean. Well, money. you say the following. He was almost unlovable. He was contradictory. He quizzed me incessantly. He challenged everything I said. He demanded attention. He could be petty. He uttered heresies about Africa. He fussed. He mocked. He made his innocent wife cry. He had impossible standards. He was self-important. He was obsessive on the subject of his health. He hated children, music, and dogs. But the rest of that is, why then? But, but when I was with him, I had to be at my best. I had to be at my best. Because someone's like that, someone as difficult as I've just described it. The end of that paragraph is... But I had to, to be at my best. I always had to be at my best. And that's it. The very demanding person... I mean, who wants to be with a sweetheart all the time? You want to be with someone who's getting the best out of you. The nagging coach, the tough teacher. He was the tough teacher. He said, don't, don't show me yeah. anything unless you expect me to be brutal. And he was brutal. Do you think there's anything in, in this book that his friends don't know, that people know? I mean, he is not known to be an easy man. He's not a mixer. He doesn't, he doesn't get out much. He doesn't friends, suffer fools easily, No, as he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have uh, close friends. As a matter of fact, I, for a long time, I was the only person that he wrote letters to, he even said it. So I, had this, I, I, could, I based this on a lot of letters that I got. Uh, but that's, uh, that question is, uh, is, there any, is there anything new? Are there any news there for uh, people? Yeah, I, I, look at the, we're in Rwanda, driving around Rwanda. 
Goma, where you know there's a big trouble in Goma at the moment, in Kigali, 1966, driving around Rwanda and the Congo, uh, his friends could not possibly have known that. I took him everywhere in East Africa, and uh, he was delighted by it. I, I well, not everywhere in East Africa, but I showed him a lot of East Africa that I knew because I had been living there in the 60s, and no one could possibly have known what that was like. And then I saw those drives, the drives that we were on, turn into literature. I mean, he wrote a book called In a Free State. And a lot of the things that I saw, that I remember some dogs chased us. He put that in the book. He met some Africans on the road with powder on their faces. He put that in the book. And Machi people that we knew. So it was kind of interesting. In that Machiko Kakatani, New York Times. Shadow, the book, gradually devolves into an angry rant that drops all pretense of trying to create a fair or nuanced portrait. Well, who wants a fair and nuanced portrait? I mean, who? The, the thing is, this is uh, not something for the Vatican Library. This is this is a book. You know, it's, it has passion. Maybe it's irrational. I don't know. I don't even care. But, I didn't read the review. But it's not nuanced or fair. It's nuanced. In your judgment. And, of course it's nuanced and fair, in my judgment. Yeah. She might not find it so. But the thing is, do you really want to write the book that the book reviewer wants you to write? I mean, who are these people? Who are they? On the make, perfidious journalists, on the whole, who are envious of a writer's reputation. That's all reviewers are. I mean, they're like eunuchs in a harem. <laughs> they're eunuchs. They see the act being performed every day and they say, gee, I'd like to do that, but I'm a eunuch. That's the reviewer. So we pay no attention to them and get on with it. You if don't even read them? Uh, with this book, I haven't read it. That's the first. Okay, well, let me give you another one just while we're here. Oh, reviewing that. <laughs> this is from uh, Richard Eder in the, in, the Richard Eder in the Los Angeles Times. Now, Paul is a thorn bush writing about a thorn bush. Talking about you, he says, for throw, uh, the, by, 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 that, that it is a thorn bush writing about a thorn bush. Well, that's harmless. Oh, yeah, that's a felicitous phrase. Yeah, exactly. That? That's harmless. <laughs> the guy uh, can't write. So. <laughs> oh, here's from David Nicholson, the Washington Post. He's con I didn't realize I was going to bring you all this news, but here we are. Because <laughs> you can, as you, as you say, you can take it. Yeah. He's conveniently forgotten all the help that Paul gave him when he needed it most, expressing confidence in the younger man's writing, introducing him to his age and publisher, encouraging him to write reviews and journalistic pieces to keep his name before readers, taking him parties where he met the likes of Edna O'Brien, Lady Antonia Frazier, and Lynn Dayton. Well, that's a steaming pile of parrot droppings. And the other thing is, that's the very sort of thing that writers, that, that reviewers said about Boswell. When Boswell wrote his, his Life of Johnson, that's exactly the sort of thing that they were saying. What right does he have? Here's this whippersnapper writing about this great man. And actually, Boswell's book, as you've said, is one of the great books in the canon. It is one of the great books. But when Boswell's book came out, people were talking about the impropriety of reporting conversations. He's a thorn bush. He's an upstart. The very things that, you, that you're quoting, it's why I don't read reviews. And it's also why you can't pay any attention to it. Because if, if uh, Boswell had been affected by that, he'd said, by the way, I'm going to write about yeah. Dr. Samuel Johnson. They'd say, no, don't do it. You don't have any right to do that. And yet it's, it's one of the great books. Um, you know, a review really doesn't matter much. I don't think a review matters less than whether it's raining in Patagonia. You know, <laughs> so there is a book. The next day, no, you you have to. <laughs> and I know that you're reading those with a grain of salt. You're just trying to taunt me, but I don't care. Not to taunt you, to get your reaction. And, right. and taunting was a little strong. What I'm trying to do, but if it taunts you, then I'm not displeased. No, no, no I think, but I think I think that's somewhat irrelevant. But actually. Uh, I, I collected all the reviews that, uh, that Boswell got when he wrote his book about Johnson. I don't know of another, apart from Johnson, I don't know of another book like this. And I would say that that's, that's the vindication, that it's not Joyce Maynard, it's not Tina Turner, it's not Bride of Chucky, it's it. It's what it is. And this is not um, La Carre and Rushdie. No, that's a feud. That's a quarrel. This isn't a quarrel. A, a quarrel or a feud goes on for a long period of time. This is 30 years of friendship, funniness, and generosity, and then a very short ending. A short, bitter ending, perhaps, but brief, brief. It's not about a quarrel. No, Rushdie and Lacare uh, had a quarrel, and then and there have been other literary quarrels. This is Lots Lillian, of them. Yeah, Lillian, Lillian Hellman and uh, uh, Mary McCarthy. This, yeah. is, no, it's not a, this isn't a quarrel. And you'll notice Naipaul has said nothing about this book. I know, I was going to make that point. Yeah. Now, what does that say about him? Something good? It shows how dignified he is, how he's standing apart from it. Let it happen. He's always said, uh, the book, yeah. a book has to go its own way. He always said that. So, you notice he's not scrapping. He's not, he's not fighting. He's not disputing it. Pretty good, isn't it? I mean, it, I have great admiration 
for the man. And I can say honestly that his work inspired me and helped make me a writer. So there's no ingratitude in and me. And what do you want us to know about him in the end? Just to know him rather than to know about him? I think to know, for a reader to know that he's a man, that I'm a man, that a, a, a human being, a person who has faulty foibles, dysfunctional, problematical, eccentric, a crank, that writers aren't great moral beacons of any, they're, 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 uh, we're inadequate or else we wouldn't be writers. It's our inadequacies that make us writers. It's not cutting someone down to size. It's showing us, you know, in, in our nakedness, what we are. Interesting. It's very interesting. And be, because you see the man behind the mask, the man behind the name on the book. And anything that helps humanize literature, I'm for. Because literature is not written by gods. It's written by people. With foibles and virtues. In equal measure, maybe more foibles than virtues. Servidio's Shadow, a friendship across five continents. Paul, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you for coming. Thank Pleasure. you, John. Very much. Yeah. We'll be right back. Stay with us.